Hello, this is Helen Donovan, the unit coordinator. I wanted to um, talk you through the workshop, workshop one. This is for those people who might have missed the workshop because of placement or illness or other issues. Um, and also for anyone who might want to have a revision of what we did in the workshop and what we did in the workshop. So of course we can't do the interactive parts of the workshop that we did um, in the classroom, but I can talk you through the key concepts and you um, should be able to engage with those yourself individually. So let's work through this, the slides here. So in the workshop, um, we, the introduction was looking at these key purposes. And of course, we're looking at the key uh, concepts of chronic disease and health promotion. And I'll talk some more about those as we work through and just remind you of the importance of really having such a strong platform of knowledge about these areas before you even started this workshop and assessment one, because it is such a strong uh, and important area of practice for you. So chronic disease, let's move that over there. Chronic disease um, and what we talked about in the introductory lecture, and if, if you haven't listened to the introductory lecture, I would encourage you to do that because that gives you an overview of the whole of semester's expectation and work, and it will set you up really nicely for what you need to be doing. Um, and as we're now um, starting week four, it's really important that you are on top of everything and very much have a study plan for the remainder of the semester. So the definition we're working with in our chronic disease perspective is from the textbook, uh, uh, Johnson and Chang, 2018, are the editors. Um, if you haven't purchased a textbook yet, please go to the bookshop and do so. There are only a few eBooks in the library and you 100% need this textbook to be able to do well in this unit. So please get access to that textbook. Um, so they don't give a definition of chronic disease. So uh, what they do do is talk about the common features, which we can see here, and it's on page three of the textbook. So when you're referring to chronic disease um, and when you're talking about it in a workshop such as this, or in your assessment talking about chronic disease, you need to draw from these common features uh, because that's what we're looking at and that's how we, we're um, approaching it for this unit. So it has a complex causality, so multiple things causing it, a long development period, so it takes a long time for the problems to occur. It may have a what they call a prolonged course, meaning that the course of the illness goes for a long period of time. And it also may be associated with functional impairment or disability, which we commonly see, and as nurses, we work with um, all the time. Um, and remember, of course, there are risk factors and protective factors, and you need to be um, conscious of those and be aware of those when you're working through the case studies. So in the introductory lecture, we talked about um, health promotion and we're working with the World Health Organization health promotion definition, which is this one here. Health promotion is the process of enabling people to increase control over and to improve their health. Now, this is really important that you understand this and you make sense of what this definition means. This unit particularly focuses on working from a partnership perspective, from a health promotion perspective, and because it's from a chronic disease perspective, of course, we're looking at it from a tertiary prevention approach, which is what you need to do through all of your assessment pieces. And while you have been working with, um, from a medical, surgical, pathophysiological approach, now you need to start looking at it from a health promotion approach. And it doesn't mean that you're not looking at the other aspects of the patient's needs. This is just a different approach, which needs to be integrated with all of your care. So increasing control over is really important. And you need to be very aware of that. There are other key points here, looking at the person's physical, mental and social well-being. So we look at it from a holistic perspective. Uh, we look, it says health is therefore seen as a resource for everyday life, not the objective of living. 
So it's looking at everyday life aspects that we can help people take control over their health. And this is vital when you're writing your goals and you're looking at your interventions. Um, also health is a positive concept. So being healthful and healthy, we look at it from a positive perspective. Now these aspects are very important. We want to help people identify and realise aspirations. We want to empower people to be able to take control of their health. We want to enable people. We want them to bring about change or to be able to cope with the environment they're in if that's what is needed for them to be able to move forward. Okay, so this was our workshop um, where you, um, everyone was getting into groups and starting to meet one another. So we're looking at health promotion and the person with chronic disease and we're using the clinical reasoning cycle. So why the clinical reasoning cycle? Well, firstly, it's what is used across the board in most health care facilities now is the clinical reasoning cycle. Um, it is a nice systematic approach to assessing the patient's needs, planning their care, implementing the interventions and then evaluating the, the care. So it is a very, um, <clears throat> clear approach to uh, patient assessment and identifying patient needs. Now previously you have used the clinical reasoning cycle from a pathophysiological perspective, from a mental health perspective. Now you're going to be using it from a health promotion perspective and start tying all those key parts about lifestyle and um, uh, together and be able to work with those. Now assessment is different um, when you are looking at it from a health promotion perspective. While we're not ignoring the um, medical diagnosis, the background information that is still there and still must be written in your assessment, um, we are looking at other aspects. We're very much looking at determinants of health, lifestyle, environmental factors that are impacting on a person's health. Now when you're assessing, there are these two models here that I've provided for you. And these are, you can use either one of these models. And for anyone who studied NSB 105 as a first year, you will know that this model on the left was the one that was used, but also you've been introduced to the model on the right as well. Now it doesn't matter which model you use, they're all focused on the determinants of health. So you need to be use either one or a combination um, if that's what uh, helps you. So if we look at the one on the right, it looks, it starts off looking at the personal factors, the age, the gender of the person, constitutional factors, genetic factors, things that people were, were might be born with that is influencing their, uh, their health and their life. Then it goes to the individual lifestyle factors and these are about how well people eat, do they exercise, do they smoke um, tobacco, do they drink alcohol, all of those sort of things. Do they have a sedentary, stressful lifestyle? That's the sort of factors that you be considering here when you're assessing a person. The next part are the social and community networks. Who are the support structures around the person? Are they in a family? Do they have someone to look after them when they become ill? Um, does the community have support systems in place? Do they have um, sporting venues? You know, what's around them? Is there a healthcare service around them that can help them? Then we're looking particularly at living and working conditions here. So housing, you know, what sort of housing do you live in? Do you live in a house that that's, might leak when it rains? Is it drafty and cold in the winter? Uh, where is it geographically? Is it in a rural setting? Is it in an urban setting? Is it in an environment where burglaries are prone and people feel unsafe? So housing is very important. Um, what healthcare services are available? What water and sanitation services are available? Employment, you know, is the person employed? Do they have financial um, support? The work environment, we know that a person's work environment can influence their health. So if you work in an environment that's very dusty, then of course you're going to inhale that dust and you're going to potentially have respiratory problems. A person's education is very important. Um, so we know that uh, people who have higher education, of course, are more able to get higher paid positions and jobs. 
Also people with higher education are more able to think critically because they've been asked, been encouraged to think critically and ask, you know, why is this happening? How is this happening? Who's involved here? How did it get to this point? Those sort of questions, which is what you must ask as a critical thinker. And then agriculture and food, what food is available to you um, and uh, to the person? Is it nutritious food? Is it non-nutritious food? Um, what's available? And then the last band is about the um, general socioeconomic um, aspects, governmental aspects. Um, you know, what, what money is spent, spent on healthcare? Is it a, a healthcare for all approach that we have in this country? Or is it always a paid um, system? You know, what sort of money is spent on hospitals, resources, facilities, things like that? So it's important to think about all of these factors when you're thinking about health assessment and health promotion. This model on the left similarly looks at the physical environment the person lives in, the social environment they live and work within, lifestyle and, and behaviours, and the economic environment. So as I said, either model is absolutely fine for you to use. It is entirely up to you, but you use these. Put headings to direct so it's very clear which parts you're assessing. So if you look at this slide, this was an activity for um, everyone in the workshop and um, it lists 12 social determinants of health that come from this link here, Australia's Health 2016, Chapter 4, Determinants of Health. Now I would encourage you to, to go to that link and to read about the, these factors so that you really have a strong understanding and you're not just guessing as to what you think might be going on. So the activity was to discuss how these determinants might influence a person with a chronic disease's quality of life. So someone who's got an existent chronic disease, so remember we're talking about tertiary prevention here. So how does a person's income and financial security impact on their quality of life? A person with a chronic disease, how does having security with income and financial security, how does that influence their quality of life? Now, as I said, what we did was there were 12 groups and everybody in the group um, were given one of these determinants of health to talk about. And you'll find on the workshop one page, there's a Padlet. And on the Padlet, there is a heading for each one of these. So you choose one, stop the um, video now, choose one, click on this link here, read about it, and then go onto the Padlet and read um, what's already been there and add your con your thoughts. And if you might say, oh, it's all there. Everyone's put, in, put everything I could possibly put down there. Think about putting it in a new way, in your own words. This is what you need to do with paraphrasing. So be, be constantly thinking about how else it could be written, a better way, a more insightful way, a more comprehensive way. Be thinking about that. So practice that here. It's a really good opportunity. The other thing from the clinical reasoning cycle is when we go into the planning section is we're looking at thinking about what the person's needs are. So we're processing that information. We look, we've gathered all the information and we're putting it together and we're saying, okay, what's going on here? We're looking for connections. We're looking for patterns. Um, you know, if a person's obese, we might see a link between their diet and their obesity, or we might see a link between their lack of exercise and their obesity, or their sedentary job and their, their obesity. So we're looking for the links. We're looking to make sense of what's going on here for this person. And then from that, we're going to identify uh, issues and problems, the problems of healthcare problems a person might have. So we might decide that a person has an obesity issue and it's because of lack of exercise, primarily. And we're going to set a goal. But remember, our goal needs to be from enabling the person to take control of their health. Our goal isn't just for the person to lose weight. Our goal is for the person to understand that they need to lose weight and how they will lose weight. That's our goal. So we want them to take control, not us taking control. The next step is implementation. So we've got to plan the intervention. 
what are we going to do? Where, when and how are we going to do this? Now, because we want people to take control of their own health, we want people to be aware of what their needs are. And we want them to be aware of if there needs to be a change in their health. And there's no point you know, providing people with education because we know that health literacy is a big area in health promotion. So there's no point providing them just with the education or the information if they're not ready to bring about that change. So this is where our change models come in. And you will see that I have two here on this screen and I talked about these in the introductory lecture, the trans theoretical model of change. And this is the motivational uh, interviewing model of change. There's also readings in your, in your modules. So there's lots of information for you. So there are um, webinars from Jason Mills. There's a video. So if you still don't understand exactly how this works from a health promotion perspective, then search for it in the library. There's lots of library resources about it and that will show you those links. So really there's lots of textbooks in the library as well. So if you still don't have a strong grasp of the concepts from what you've worked through in the modules and your readings and the lecture, then of course, look further afield to be able to understand. It's very important you do this and it's your responsibility to do this. Um, so if I just go through each one just briefly for you here. So the trans theoretical model of change, this is very much looking at how people are perceiving change in their life and the need for change. And we talk about pre-contemplation. This is where we have a person who's not even considering change. They think everything is absolutely fine. There's no need to even think about a change or they may be just unaware that what they're doing is cause, might be causing harm to themselves or harm to their, the people around them. So that's the pre-contemplation stage. So as nurses, our job is to raise people's awareness of what is happening to them and being able to point out that there are things that can be done um, to change. So hopefully with those, that information, you can move to the contemplation stage where the person saying, okay, well, maybe I do need to change. Maybe what I'm doing after all, isn't so great. So they're contemplating it. Haven't decided on it, but have just said, okay, maybe. Then we move to the decision where the person says, right, okay, I have to change this. I have to stop smoking. Clearly it's causing harm to me, it's causing harm to my family. I have to stop this. And this is where as nurses, we help people to develop plans, we implement change strategies with them. And this is where then we move on to the act of change, where the behavior changes, the person reduces their smoking or they stop their smoking or something like that. So that's the act of change. And then they maintain that. And it's very difficult, we know. It's very easy to make a change, but then two days later, three days later, one week later, we start reverting back because changing routines and behaviors and habits takes time. So that can be um, <clears throat> difficult for people. So that maintenance is difficult. And sometimes people will relapse and they'll return back to that behavior they had before. And then we have to start the cycle again with them. So that's the trans theoretical model of change. Now, when you're working with people, everybody is within that model somewhere. So you need to pick up from where they are. So if a person is considering change, then you start working with them from the contemplation perspective. Okay. You're still not at a stage where you can provide information if you're looking at a health literacy perspective because they're considering it. They still need to understand why they should change and how the change will be important. So that's where you start. If a person is at the pre-contemplation stage, then you need to go right back to the beginning and raise their awareness of how change will help them in their lifestyle. If a person said, okay, I want to change, that's when you start looking at, at strategies, interventions that you're going to implement and support systems to be able to help that person take control of the change. They must take control of that change and they must determine, I need to change. 
you provide the information, you provide support structures and they choose, okay, this is what I'm going to do to be able to do that. The act of change, if they're up to actually changing, they've started, they said, look, I've started, I've started reducing how much I smoke, that's really great. Smoke cigarettes, that's really great because then you're going to be able to reinforce that change, maybe add some other options um, that might support them further and move on. If they are maintaining their new behaviour, again, we must support them in that. We don't say, oh, they've changed, they're fine. No, we need to find out, make sure that they are um, maintaining it and that they're not waning and they don't need extra support. And they might say, look, I've stopped, but it's really, really difficult. Is there anything else I can do? So it's important to work within that model of change. And often your interventions can't start until you get the person to this decision stage where they've decided on stage or further around. Um, that's when you can start and implement your interventions that you might normally have into, um, put in place. The other um, change approach would be motivational interviewing. And it's up to you to choose which of the models you use. You might use both models. You might find that you need a combination of both to be able to move forward here. But this is the, the steps that you will see. These are very common steps. There's a lot of information about motivational interviewing. So again, as I said, really work through that um, the material that's provided for you. And if you're still struggling with it, certainly go out searching further because there's lots of information. But just briefly, step one is engaging. Okay, this is where you engage, you develop your therapeutic relationship. You want people to trust you and to know that you're there to support them and help them. So developing rapport, demonstrating empathy is very important to be able to um, um, have people listen to you and trust that you are there for them and that you, you're not there just to waste their time. It's really important that engaging. Um, if you find as you're working through the process, people start resisting, then you might have to go back to the engaging stage because you may not have actually um, really um, got their focus and their attention and they may not feel as though you, you are 100% there for them. So it's very important that you um, develop the therapeutic relationship right, right from the beginning. The next step is guiding or focusing is what some of the other literature says. And this is helping the person to focus on what's important in relation to their health. So if we look at the person who's smoking tobacco, we find out what's important and they might say, it's really important that I'm able to run around and play cricket with my, my kids, things like that. Okay, and then you can start saying, well, okay, well, well how are you going with that? Like, oh, I'm a bit short of breath. So start working with, well, you know, the, the cigarette smoking, the tobacco smoking does have, have an impact on your lung function and you start raising their awareness as to what's going on with their current behaviours and how that's impacting on their health and really help getting them to set up a goal. What do you want to achieve? What is it that you want in your health? Um, so we've got that. And then the evoking is really getting people to think about how they're going to move towards that goal. So you might give them some options. Well, you know, you can reduce how much tobacco you smoke, you could stop altogether, uh, you know, things like that. So really giving them some options as to what they could use, the support structures that are in place, um, and really get them thinking about how they're going to move towards that goal. And then the planning is the decisions that are made. They've had the options, and then we're going to assist them and move them towards the change and encourage them to have that commitment to change. So you can see that there are similarities with the previous model, but this model, we're encouraging them to a commitment to change, but then the other model moves forward to actually bringing about the change and maintaining the change. So you may want to put them together if you like, or um, use them as a standalone, up to you. But important that you use um, these in your planning and your implementation, and certainly important to show it in your assessment that this is a very important part of health promotion and helping the person to take control and to feel they have an independent responsibility to be able to be in control of their own health. 
So if we move, keep moving through the clinical reasoning cycle, then there's the evaluation stage, which is this last part here in blue. So this is, was the intervention effective to achieve the goal? And remember our goal is about the person taking control of their health and wellness. So were the interventions effective? Were the strategies that we used to bring about change effective um, for the person to be able to or want to take control of their health and well-being? And this is the evaluation you're looking for. So you're looking at the outcome, okay? So was the outcome what we were looking for? Was the process effective? Because it, it might be the process was not effective and that's why you didn't achieve the outcome. So look at both, don't just look at the outcome, look at how you got there as well and why that was important. So we are looking, when you write your evaluation criteria, write it from the perspective of the health promotion definition of the person achieving control. Um, now in the workshops, what I, allowed, what I asked everyone to do was just to have a chat in their groups about the clinical reasoning cycle, making sure everybody felt really um, as though they knew what it was. But we'll move on from that. This was our, our scenario and um, the students in the workshops were able to interview both of these, um, Albert and his wife, Phoebe, who was the carer. But I can just talk you through some of the, the key concepts here. So it says you are a community health nurse who specialises in health promotion and you've been asked to visit Albert and Phoebe in their home. So you specialise in health promotion. That's the area that you're going to focus on. So we know that Albert and Phoebe live in a Queenslander home. It has three bedrooms and one bathroom. The furnishings and decor appear to be from the 1970s era. It's a single level building up a flight of stairs of six steps at the front and 12 steps at the back. The laundry is under the house with an outside clothesline um, only. It's their only facility to dry clothing. The house appears neat and tidy, although shabby. In the centre of the house is the lounge area where you find Albert sitting, or rather lying, in a recliner. He has a bowl of sweets on the armrest of the chair and you can see a cup of tea on a nearby coffee table. You are met at the door by Phoebe, who greets you tentatively and asks you to come into the lounge area and sits you on a three-seater lounge close to Albert. She has to move a small grey cat to allow you to sit. Okay, so that's the context. That's some background information for you, for their, their community where they live. So Albert, his preferred name is Al. He's 79 years of age. He's had a right-sided stroke six months ago. He's mobile, but with a three-pronged walking stick. He's clearly obese. He has a ruddy facial complexion. He's got a dressing on his left ankle. Both legs appear a dermatist. His left arm and hand are resting awkwardly in, on the chair. Now Phoebe is Albert's carer. She is 75 years of age. She has obvious osteoarthritis in her hands and feet. She looks thin and quite frail and she fusses around Al. So this is the information, this is the, what you see when you arrive. Um, so, and it's important to be thinking about these perspectives from a health promotion and a determinants of health perspective. Because remember, we talked about in the model, if we go back to our model. So if we look at one more, if we look at even at this model, a person's age, their sex and their constitutional factors impact on their health. So Albert, 79, male, he's had a stroke. And we can see he's clearly obese. Okay, here, if we look at perhaps their physical environment, we look at housing. It's got steps to go up and down. The laundry's downstairs. There's one bathroom. Things to be thinking about there. If we look at lifestyle, diet, he looks obese. He has a bowl of sweets at his arm that you can see immediately. He's lying back in the recliner. So things to be observing 
when you first, the very first information that you get. So what we did is um, the groups interviewed Al and they interviewed Phoebe and got lots of information from Al and Phoebe. Then we had a break and we had a photograph taken of everyone in the group and then everybody came back and started working through their assessment and planning. Now you'll notice that this template is slightly different to the template that I provided for you for assessment one. That is because assessment one has um, clinical um, progress notes, medication charts, things like that to fill in, whereas this doesn't. So in this situation, you don't have that material. So that's the only reason why it's different. And the other one's broken up just to help um, you with your assessment to be able to um, identify the key factors that you might step through. So it's exactly the same, same information here. So it says from the determinants of health perspective, note your initial perception. So this is your background information, the context of care. It's in the person's home, the type of home they live in, you know, the type of um, um, the background information about um, medical history, things like that, things you observed about Phoebe, all of that goes in here. Then your data from the interviewing and the observing. So you've got some data from that written information. You don't have all of it because you're not in the position to interview, but all of that data goes there. So remember the sub subject of data is what um, the person tells you. So what Al from Albert and Phoebe would tell you and the objective is what you observe um, and what you see is going on. Now the third part is those health uh, patterns and connections I talked about before. So what are the connections with what you're seeing is going on here? Um, and remember, these are just here to promote to um, remind you working within these structures here as well. Then we go across to the planning part, identifying health problems. And what I asked everyone to do here was to list all of the health problems, every single one you could identify from the interview and from the written information that you had on the two slides. So just lists and lists and lists of all the problems. Then what I asked, uh, what was asked in the workshop was to prioritize three top health problems. And remember this, these need to be from a health promotion perspective, from these determinants of health perspective is where they need to come from. So we might be looking at things like um, Social, iso social isolation because it's difficult for Albert to get in and out of the house is a problem. We might also look at it from a, um, a diet perspective, you know, lack of knowledge about appropriate um, suitable diet. We might look at it from a lack of knowledge about um, using a walking stick correctly, the fourth prong walker, things like that. So they're the things we're looking at from the problems. We're not looking at it from a medical perspective, we're looking at it from a health promotion perspective where we're promoting the person's health from a tertiary prevention perspective. So read more about tertiary prevention and then you'll understand the problems you've identified, how they relate to health promotion. Then everyone was asked to write a goal in relation to that problem. And remember your goal is for the person to take control of their health and well-being. That's what your aim is in this situation. So if we look at social isolation as an example of a problem, then our goal is that we want for either one, depending on who we identified as being socially isolated, our goal is for them to have contact with other people, other groups, whatever it was that came up in the interview that um, the people said was important to them when we were looking at their um, interviewing. The next part is planning. Okay, so here, um, so here what I, what we got everyone to do was to, to, to join, two groups join and to share what they wrote in their planning section and really start negotiating things, working together as you would in a healthcare facility. You need to work together, you need to collaborate, you need to communicate, you need to negotiate and share what you have written and come up with 
as one large group come up with the three problems, three health promotion problems and the three goals from those and agree with them um, as a group. And you know that should take time. That should take a lot of nutting out. No one should just give in. Everybody should say, well, I don't really understand why that is the case and, um, and then um, be able to explain it and work through it really carefully. Then in that larger group, everyone was looking at how they're going to implement. So for each of the priority problems, we're talking about how the interventions were going to be implemented. Um, and remember, you may need, and certainly with Albert and Phoebe, they were very much not at the maintenance of change. They were very much around at the beginning. Um, so you need to be thinking about how you're going to bring them out a mindset of change and then the, in, the intervention you're going to implement once you have gotten to that stage. And that needs to be clearly stated here in your intervention implementation section. So a few students have asked me about the details. What's important? Think about the person reading this. Remember your healthcare plan is not just for you, it's for the whole of the healthcare team. They're the ones who need to be able to look at this and be able to see exactly what the plan is. So you need to very, it needs to be very detailed. Your goal needs to be like a SMART goal. It needs to be very specific and it needs to be something that's measurable. Your interventions, the strategies that you might use in your interventions need to be very clearly stated so that when the next person comes and looks at this plan, when you've gone home off your shift, they can see what's been done, okay? I can see the previous nurse has done this and this and this. If you just make a general comment, a general sentence statement, that's not going to help the person coming behind you. They need to know exactly what the plan is and what steps were taken towards achieving that goal. So be very detailed here in your interventions, the strategies that you plan to use here. Must be very, very clear. Step them out uh, with each one. So for each problem, you needed to have very clear interventions. Now with your evaluation, you needed to evaluate, again, number each one. These are your problems. Numbered, you've numbered your problems, numbered your goals, and now you're going to, for each of those problems that are numbered, you need to have an evaluation criteria that you're going to use as a measurement tool to measure if you have achieved that goal. So you may have, if you might have a lot of steps here that you needed to go through, that you feel you need to go through to be able to um, achieve an effective intervention, then you need to step all of those through here to be able to determine if you were effective. So remember, you're looking at process and outcome. So you're saying, did I engage well with the person? Okay. Did I develop that trusting relationship? Is what you're looking for here. So you're going to be looking at the process you went through. And then did you achieve that outcome? You need to do that for each one. And then write a reflection. What have you learned from this experience? What would you do differently next time? That's really important to come up with. So details, number them, number the problems, number the steps, and then do the corresponding numbers as well. Because in your assessment, it needs to be very clear that it flows, that your assessment relates to your planning, your planning relates to your interventions you implement, you're going to implement, and your evaluation criteria relates as well. So numbering it shows your marker, very clearly how they align. So make sure that's very, it's easy to see. The other thing we did in the workshop, which was a lot of fun, was each group presented, had a presentation. So there were two parts to the presentation. The first was two slide PowerPoint presentation. In the first one, you're going to present your priority problems and the strategies. Strategies, that you're going to, strategies and interventions that you're going to use, you're going to implement. Also, you were asked to refer to the model of change you would use and present that as well. 
And then the next part was presenting the evaluation criteria that you would use to enable the effectiveness of those strategies interventions to see if you had been able to achieve that goal. Now, if you do, if you had, um, as a group, had a very clear structure in your interventions and strategies that you're going to implement, if your evaluation was very clear, then this part was very easy because it was just a matter, get the right slide, it was just a matter of writing it, putting it into the slides because you had already done this. Now this will be exactly the same for your assessment one piece. If your template is very, very clear and stepped out very, very well, then when you write your essay, it's all there. It will flow straight across from your paper, from your template to your paper. And it needs to be able to do that. You need to be able to justify those interventions, justify the strategies, justify the, the model of change you're going to use. You need to be able to justify those um, and they need to reflect back to that template. So the purpose, so going back to the presentation, the first part was the two slide PowerPoint. The second part was to write a script and then role play how you would implement that. How you would implement those strategies and interventions, what it would look like. And some of the students, you know, did such a good job with this. You know, it was very clear, it was a very logical stepping out of looking at the problem, looking at the strategies and interventions that were in place and referring to the model of change that would be used and then the evaluation criteria that would be used to assess the process and the outcome um, of those interventions and, and whether you would achieve the goal. And in the second part was the script, really being able to show how you're going to do that um, right from the beginning from the, the um, introducing yourself stating the purpose and stepping it all the way through. So it was a really, really nice um, opportunity to see that. And that was the end of the workshop that we worked through. The workshop's very valuable because it immerses you into the concept of health promotion. And um, even though I know some students did have done NSB 105, which introduced you really nicely to health promotion, and certainly your second piece of assessment in NSB 105 introduced you to it really clearly, then you were, um, it stepped you one step further along as well. For those graduate entry students who didn't study NSB 105, it's an assumed knowledge. So it's assumed that you will go and you will read and you will find out that information that you don't have. But in saying that, there is a lot of information in the, um, uh, the modules and the readings and the introductory lecture is there as well. For any students who are struggling with um, using the clinical reasoning cycle, please make sure you go and you read chapter one in the clinical reasoning cycle text that's in the QUT readings. Um, uh, Tracy Levitt-Jones is the person who designed that structure. So that is the book where it all has come from. So it's very important that you have that very strong understanding um, of all of the concepts uh, before you come to the workshop. Um, and then that will also prepare you for the assessment as well. So thank you very much for that.